<clears throat> so greetings everyone wherever you <laughs> wherever you think you are <laughs> this crazy virtual reality <laughs> and uh, wherever you are yourself well, let's uh, spend some time focusing on that and uh, we'll begin with paying our respects to the triple gem. Thank 
So let's spend some time <clears throat> collecting ourselves. <clears throat> I mean, to the sense of being, you know, whatever we imagine our identities are, but sort of beneath that, the fact of consciousness, the fact of being conscious, before we're conscious of anything in particular, just the fact of being alive, you know, and really, you know, focusing on that being conscious, chitta, quality, and uh, just reducing engagement with what we're conscious of, the thoughts, sounds, sights, possibles, emotions, moods, just noticing, but pausing on running any energy down those channels and realizing yeah, your energy can collect instead into this sense of being conscious, being aware. Like it's, uh, it's not just a visual thing, it's an actual felt experience of um, certain vitality to it, presence. bringing the power of attention onto that. So this uh, another facet of citta, the ability to attend, and to give attention. And this manas faculty, the ability to form a focus when we are attentive, our awareness rests on that experience of being here. The more you linger in that, more that tends to brighten, become more strong, evident. Doesn't say anything, doesn't do anything. Presence. And notice how that affects <clears throat> the, any bodily effects that if your breath rate changes, if your muscle tone changes, 
your posture changes, you know, and bringing your physical body into awareness, this sense of it. So how is this affecting the physical body? Does it affect the physical body? Skin, nerves, posture, vitality. The overall sense of the shape that you have right now, seen directly, not inferred or imagined or remembered, but experienced directly. Can you describe any kind of shape to that? Maybe it doesn't have a shape. Texture. Warmth. So turning the tracks of one's normal preoccupations or thought patterns, if you're diverting a railway, diverting it runs those normal places we, that our mind will run to, just diverting it to stay in this inquiring, feeling, exploring this territory, absorbing. Uh, appreciating, uh, lingering, savoring, these kind of, uh, not thinking about it, just drinking it in. and extending it through your body. If you are sitting on a chair, for example, really try to feel out uh, the soles of your feet um, as if they can open. And the skin, the soles of your feet, make that soft and open as if you're opening your hands. Same with the palm of your hands and the temples of your head. So it's opening the skin boundary of the body so there's a sense of allowing the energy of chitta to flow quite freely, not be constricted by a habitual grasping of form.
Rama Chaloka Dipati Sahampati Kantanjali Anadiwaram Ayachata Santida Sata Parajakajatika De se tu damam anukam pimam pajam. Namu tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namu tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato rahato samma sambuddhasa buddhang dhammang sangham namasami. So <clears throat> once again reviewing this quality, this experience, chitta, and remembering this is a uh, word that comes from the uh, Vedic tradition, Indian Vedic tradition. And in the Vedanta, the Upanishads, you have a triad, Sat, Chit, Ananda. Sat, and these are derived from the Sanskrit. Sat means presence. Chit, they call it pure consciousness or uh, pure being conscious. Ananda bliss. Now, obviously, when the Buddha the Buddha was talking around the time that these Upanishadic teachings were being were in circuit, and clearly he was in the uh, in the um, tradition in the lineage of wandering seekers, so they'd all been familiar with these kinds of words. This had been the language they spoke. Uh, they weren't they weren't scientists. They weren't um, you know, into anatomy or geography, they were into, you know, the, the domain of, of uh, what it is to be alive, what is the direct feeling of it, what's the direct in yourself experience you can get without going to school or reading a book. You were living out in the forest, remember, you're wandering around mountains. Um, <laughs> you didn't have deadlines, you didn't have signs, you didn't have words, you didn't have clocks, you didn't know what time of day it was, you knew the sun, the moon, the stars, and you probably knew them very, very, very well. And you probably knew very well the seasons, and you knew very well the movements of other creatures, and you knew very well how to live in your body. Um, because if you didn't know that very well, you'd be dead. <laughs> you didn't know how to be very, very careful, agile, sensitive, tuned in, at the bodily level, when you're walking around in a, in a jungle in India in 5th century BC, you would not last long. So these are highly attuned beings. They were tuned both to this, the empirical um, requirement to be right here now, you know, on the ball, tuned in, not to particular thought, but to anything that might occur. Awareness is spread wide open, right? It might be behind you, it might be up a tree, it might be a cloud, it might be underneath your feet. You've got to have it all open. You're not focusing on any particular topic, you're focusing on everything. <laughs> and you can do this. You know, we've got so used to the abstract reality where we focus on a word, bop, 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 or a clock, these pinpoints, that we think focus is always like this, you know. <laughs> but if you fo can't focus like that in the jungle, because often you can't even see that, you have to focus like that. And what are you? If there's any focus, it's a focus on what is my nervous reaction? Am I careless? Am I frightened? Am I, yeah, really attuned to whether you're alert, 
where, what kind of mind state is affecting you because that could have a radical effect upon whether you're careful or not. If you're reckless, impatient, caught up with anger, you could blunder around and do yourself harm. So you're very attuned to how, what kind of mind states are arising in this context. Mm. You're not searching for one, you're searching for how do these occur, what are the skillful ones, what are the unskillful ones. There's a recognition that this process can be purified. You know? So there is just this pure being conscious, chit. There's just pure being, sat. And there's, that is a blissful state, ananda, sat, chit, ananda. Now this is the background, you might say. Um, so this is what, 2,500, 2,600 years ago come a long way in some respects. Society's moved along, we're now very abstract. Words, ideas, tomorrows, calendars, dates, journals, programs, plans, agendas, economic facts, budget decline, income taxes, where is this stuff? <laughs> you know, all kinds of nationalities, what, what's that mean, you know? Uh, Boundaries on maps. We didn't have boundaries on maps in those times. We just we were just people, right? We live in this very, very abstracted world. Right? And it's a source of intense focus. You know, national politics, economic power, uh, you know, getting things done at the right time, arriving somewhere punctually, not being late, making sure that your program is moving ahead to get to the good result in the future. This, where's that? Where's that? Yeah. Where it is, is generally stress is where it is. <laughs> so, and so the Buddha, he used all these terms, but he turned around the other, another way, he said sat, rather than sat being being, sat is satya in Pali. And what you need to know is this, the satya it's the truth of suffering, <laughs> whether you're living in that or not. <laughs> if you can clear that, the such the such of the presence, the, the apparent reality of the stressful world which impacts you, if you can see through that, this maze of constructions of future and past and what you think people think you think they think you want you don't want are you are you not are you welcome are you this or you know this kind of stuff you can see through that this is the web of suffering get through that you arrive at the paramatta satya which is the satya to do with your highest welfare where these constructed realities fizzle out don't impact and jit, in the, in the Vedic thing, is the Vedanta is pure consciousness, as Buddha said, sometimes pure, sometimes not so pure, <laughs> sometimes extremely impure. <laughs> you know, it can be purified, uh, but it's, it's like, a, you know, it's like the power of an elephant. You know, a wild elephant is a really, really dangerous creature but it can be incredibly powerful and useful. So yeah, it could be purified. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, in the purification is rather ananda bliss, he said is Nibbana, which is the unbinding, the release, sublime peace and ease. So it's often a slight twist when the Buddha uses these terms. He's using the terms that are available at the time, but he's often just angling them towards his own specific approach to uh, realization and to the fulfillment of the human condition. And they said there's definitely something in here that can be really fulfilled through mm -hmm. trained, trained mind, the trained chitta, the true satya and the bliss of Nibbana release. Now so saying <clears throat> A lot of the problems with chitta is get so caught up in passion, in fear, in aversion, 
in beliefs, in ideas. It gets fixated, mesmerized by its own constructions. So it's both has a knowing quality, it can be aware, but it also has an effective quality. It's affected. As it's affected, it gets stirred. It starts to form things. It starts to form possibilities. It starts to form desires. It starts to form could be. It starts to form it might not be fears, worries. It forms these. These are formed out of itself. So its own substance is woven into these extremely potent, vigorous forms that we experience. And desire is a very potent, real energy that we experience. And when you're in it, it's captivating. When you're in fear, you can't rationalize it. It just captures you. So this, in fact, is a form, a formation of jitter, jitter, substance being woven into these occlusive and obstructive forms that take us, do not take us to the highest welfare, but take us into the sutcha of suffering rather than the sutcha of liberation. <laughs> you know, so, so we're we'll, we'll find a way to handle that and say, well, you know, children need to be trained. Now, many of the teachers at that time, as you probably remember, or if you looked into some of your early Buddhist stuff, they were teaching these um, hypnagogic states, well, okay, let's put it another way, states of formlessness, whereby you could get out of this body into somewhere else, you know. And that was so that it's sort of like mortify the body, get somewhere else. Um, because this body is caught up with uh, pain, suffering, death, need to eat. Um, so, you know, source of impurity and contamination. Mm. The Buddha did all he could with that. And he said, well, yeah, it doesn't seem to go somewhere, you know, it's finally resolved. So let's come back into this and not take up an assumption about the body that it's, you know, but just experience it not as I see it from the outside but how it experiences itself and getting to the real basis of it and we within this we begin to experience within this very body there are there do arise these pains and aches but if you sink put your attention deeper within that there's a sense of being a sense of presence. Mm. And if your awareness comes into that, that sense of presence becomes more strong, luminous, peaceful. Mm. Now, it's not the presence of aches and pains, it's not the presence of physical circumstances, it's a somatic presence. This means an inner presence of the body itself being a sense organ, just like uh, the mind very similar to the mind actually, like the mind can know things, it can know ideas, and it can also just be knowing. Similarly, the body can feel touch, sight, touch, painful touch, pleasant touch, it also just be feeling, sensitive. So the body and the mind in this sense are very similar, compatible. And so well, actually this is quite crucial when you get an understanding of chitta, it is very, in its, in its, in its energetic aspect, it is pretty much the same as, or strongly associated with the somatic sense. Uh, you know. And so the Buddha says, well, if, if you just bring awareness to that, you can, through that, you can begin to distance yourself from the abstractions of the mind. There's no future in this, there's no past in this, there's no identity in the sense of being present, there's no nationality in it, there's no better or worse about it, there's no could be, should be about it, there's no, none of that's there. This is a very peaceful place to be. Why not bring my attention to this, dwell in this, and feel the energy of breathing in and out as it comes up through this begins to spread energy through the entire form. Then the jitta is contained within a direct somatic experience rather than running out into the world of its own creations. 
So this is, and this course can get very agreeable. <laughs> and as we say, descriptions of samadhi, one makes the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion, drench, steep, fill and pervade this body. So there's no part of one's whole body is not pervaded by rapture and pleasure. Right? That's the first jhana. Second jhana, to go on basically, same thing. Rapture and pleasure born, he makes the rapture and pleasure born of concentration, drench, steep, feel and pervade the body. So there's no part of one's entire body is not pervaded by rapture and pleasure. Third jhana, pleasure divested of rapture, no part of the whole body is not saturated in that. Fourth jhana, equanimity, pervading this body with a pure, bright mind. No part of the body is not pervaded by the pure, bright mind. Okay, sounds rather pleasant, doesn't it? <laughs> but, uh, and this is a little more than that. Um, even the formless realms, some person contacts with the body and abides in those liberations that are peaceful and immaterial, transcending forms, and the taints are destroyed through wisdom. Okay? A person contacts in their body liberations that are peaceful and immaterial, that is, they're not about sensation, they're formless, and yet you can feel them in the body transcending forms just yeah i mean I'm gonna i don't know what this means i mean i i can i've got my own impressions but i'm not going to tell you if you, you you let it sit there for yourself and the taints that's the essential thing the corruptions the essential um uh, bonds you could say or or corruptions of the mind they are destroyed by wisdom so in other words, holding the jitta steadily within this purified bodily experience, it pins it down, it saturates, it makes it feel extremely pleasant. And within that, the stillness, the wisdom of the chitta can look into that and say, well, well that's not, you don't want that. Uproot that. This is irrelevant. That doesn't, you know, you, you've gained mastery over something that normally a person doesn't have mastery over. Now, you know, we are all, get, get, we have our compulsive reactions. We jump, we get frightened, we get annoyed, we get angry, you know, we get excited, we get depressed. And you think, oh dear, why did I do that? Why did I do that? <laughs> you know, and you, because you, you just, it was reactivity. And you, you think you can't do anything about it. Well, what is saying you can? Because that reaction, it didn't come from, it wasn't a deliberate idea, it just something jumped in your nervous system. Now, when you're cultivating jitter in terms of body, you're getting right into the basic foundation of your reactivity. And you can just, you can check it, you can cool it, you can soothe it, you can ease it, you can release it, and you can eventually disband the fundamental ignorance and craving that planted it there through wisdom. So this is how it works. And as it said, even having touched with one's body the deathless, this is it, Itivutuka 52. So the deathless itself is touched with the body. Having touched with the body the deathless property free from acquisitions, having realized the relinquishing of acquisitions, free from the asava, the taints, the corruptions, the rightly self-awakened one teaches the state with no sorrow and no dust. Having touched the body with the deathless, having touched the deathless property in one's own body. So, we're not abandoning but we're not looking at a body in terms of 
ears and knees and teeth. We're looking at some fundamental property that we all know, um, uh, a sense of being here. And this, which can be murky or not even really considered much at all, because it doesn't do anything. Uh, it's got, you know, it's not attractive, it's not brilliant, it's not intelligent, it's not anything that worldly values don't accrue there. And you just me going through that. Because, precisely because of that, because this is where the worldly values don't accrue, they don't count. And you go, what a weight, what a burden off the mind. You know, you're not old, you're not young, you're not female, you're not male, you're not, you just presence. And you get your strength and vitality from that, and you make that your refuge, your foundation. Because this is what is going to, through bringing knowingness and awareness onto that, you're putting two very powerful aspects of chitta together and they form something that's got a huge power to it to check the reactive outflows, the compulsive outflows of ignorance. Now, and so we can train in this. Now just bear in mind that um, are you training this, how do you train in this? It's, uh, as we know, like breathing in and out, extraordinarily simple. Just, just stay with your breathing, just stay breathing in, breathing out, should be it. Breathing out all the time. Breathing in, breathing out, it's not complicated, it's very easy, just stay with that. Can you do it? <laughs> uh, yeah, just, just a minute. Um, why is it? <laughs> the line runs off. <laughs> Something, something's up here. I want to do it. I think it's a great idea. It's very simple. I can't do it. Uh, why? Yeah. What? What? Why is that? Yeah. Certain habitual habits have established themselves, and these habits uh, are the. You might say these are the, the hurdles that we have to, or the locks, the fetters, that we have to undo. They're not just things like ill will or lust or something like that. These are just also, these are, can be certainly flowing, but even more tenacious than that is the construction of various dimensions and levels that we call myself. Which is the mega construction of chitta. This is the big one. This is the one I believe in. This is the one I return to time and time again. My chitta returns to that. It, it weeps there. It, it exalts there. It plans from there. It wants the world to fit it. <laughs> it leads me on. <laughs> and here it is again, and I name it, and I try to improve it, and so forth. It's my favourite pet. <laughs> and we think it's such a not a big problem. Maybe it's a little bit this, that, and the other, but it's not some evil. You know, it's not evil at all. It's a construction. And part of what you begin to sense, you know, Chitta constructs this person, and the person, as you experience her or him, what is that? It's generally a, psycho a series of psychologies. It's to do with um, what I own, yeah, the feeling of owning something. That's mine. The feeling of being able to make something happen. I can do that. I want to do that, I can do it. If I can't do it, I want to do it, I feel annoyed. I want control. I want to be able to do what I want to do. You know, well, it's at my own speed. 
So it has said it, it claims control, it claims ownership. And it tends to also say everything that occurs in this mind is me. Right? Anything immaterial that occurs in, my, in awareness, that's me. A thought, that's me. An emotion, that's mine. Uh, 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 a crazy thought, that's me going crazy. A uh, wonderful idea, that's mine, my wonderful idea. Um, a strange mood, that's me. I'm going, feeling very strange right now. It identifies with a whole set of experiences. Um, and uh, you know, so if they're yours, can you sort of, um, could you say, well, I'll have this one and not that one? I'll only have the sensible ideas and not the crazy ones. Can you say, well, I'll, I'll now I'll stop thinking. And now I remember what happened last April. You don't have much say over that, do you? And how much of your mental content is really to do with what you've read, heard, been told, been trained to experience, what you've picked up from other people, what you've acquired, you know, essentially acquired dispositions. And a very, because we all live in slightly different circumstances, there's a certain uniqueness about what I've acquired, my memories, uh, my um, dispositions, what I've been living with. Yeah, I mean, so monasteries, Buddhism, monks, robes, training rules, my mind tends to operate around those because that's what it's been saturated. It's not mine, but it's been saturated in that particular domain. And so therefore I can, that I can think, am I a good monk, not a good monk, the greatest monk, the worst monk, middling, this, that, and the other identifying with notions based upon scenarios that never were mine in the first place. I never was a monk, a good one or a bad one, or anything really. But this sense of self identifies with and often takes a stand upon particular notions, ideas and wishes. I, this is the way I see it, that is right. My idea is this, it's a good idea, I believe in it, that's right. And therefore, if you disagree with it, well, you, know, you either haven't got it right or whatever, conflict. So, but you're not an idea. You don't have an idea, an idea happens to you, to your mind, because of circumstances. A mood happens to your mind because of circumstances. Same as everybody. There are particular things that only Malaysian people have that other people don't have. Everybody gets the same deal, basically, with different bits of language thrown on it. <laughs> you know, we didn't get a particular more anguish in Britain than in Japan. Or, no, no, it's the same. Uh, so, this sense of self also means that I will now do what's necessary for liberation. I will work it out as an idea. I will get my idea how to do it. So it's okay, right, good, good, good. But now you focus on your breathing. Can't do it, can you? <laughs> You get rid of your bad thoughts. You deal with your discordant emotions. You make yourself feel happy and calm. Personality can't, can't do it. It struggles, it tries. Only thing it can suppress things maybe, ignore things and seek to focus on something that will make it more agreeable. Now this personality form is a set of mental energies that are based upon <coughs> acquiring, owning, 
controlling and localizing. This is me in here, everything else out there. You know, I end at the end of this skin bag, everything else out there. It doesn't quite work like that because we recognize, oh, well, yeah, I, and I also, that's my dog. So my psychology has a territory that roams around <laughs> deciding which bits are mine and my concerns. <laughs> so it's got, it's got its boundaries, but in that it owns that and it claims that belongs to it. Yeah. Yeah. So even my football team, you know, they let me down, my team let me down. <laughs> They were mine, and they should have won, and they didn't. Yeah. So we can extend it, and it claims ownership, and because of the control, and because of it can't maintain that ownership and control, it gets unhappy. Now, these, this, is not an ident not, this is not a fixed thing. This is a series of programs and energies that run, the jitter creates, to acquire, to own, to control, to create a boundary, a self-boundary. The boundary is very permeable, very permeable. We try to maintain it sometimes, we try to extend it, get other people inside it, push people out of it. It's very permeable, it doesn't work. We try to control things, doesn't work. We try to own things, doesn't work. So we try harder, doesn't work. Now, there's nothing wrong with you. It's just these are the programs. And saying, actually, rather than get annoyed with yourself or judge yourself or think about it, try to feel what happens in your body when you get any of those programs happening, when you get the this belongs to me experience and you feel yourself threatened when something's being taken away. Do you feel the fear or the threat? Yeah. The boundaries being broken. Hmm. Control. You feel rigid when you get a lot of control. Do you go into a group and try to control, make sure everybody else does it the way you do it? And you get a certain rigidity to it. And there's a struggle when things lose control and you get annoyed and then you feel broken because you weren't able to control something. Just notice these, these patterns and the energetic effect in your own body. I mean, you know, I can sit at a meeting and the meeting says, Sangha meeting, say, well, let's have a look. Today we've got five people coming today. I mean, I'm just making this up. We've got five school children coming today, okay? Five school children coming today. And then we've got six people need to do the washing up and there also be a building supply coming. So we need three men to go and unload that. And tomorrow we're planning that Lumpur Science is coming down for a visit. And next week we're going to plan for the Katina. We're doing the Katina that's coming up. And we need to remember that, um, you know, the uh, sister so-and-so is not feeling so well, so we need to cover for her. And they said all this. And it, you think, oh my God, I feel overwhelmed. There's all this stuff going on. I can't manage it. Probably you just sat there in a room and somebody sit, spoke for five minutes. And your body, you feel already panicking, agitated, worried, concerned, and your body is stressing out. <laughs> and nothing's happened. Apart from a few signals have occurred that your mind then sent into your nervous system. And the nervous system overloaded and you felt the sense of agitation and stress. Burden, you feel burdened. And you feel these things in your body. You say, it's a weight on my back. You can feel being compressed. Um, you can feel yourself feeling really like you're no ground, losing ground, feel very unsteady. So this definitely has somatic effects. So much so that, 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 that if you're practicing with those and with, when you're experiencing any of these personality experiences, you're referring to well, what's happening in the body now that trembling or that tightening or that speediness or that flutteriness. Uh -huh. Bring your awareness to that and return from there to that sense of just being.
very important then to spend time really knowing that sense of just being present so you can navigate or return from your personality structure the energies the nervous somatic energies of that return back to this embodied presence and you feel the desire and the fear and the agitation just start to as it enters the refuge territory it deconstructs it deconstructs and then oh that was just an idea in my head nothing's happening here we are tomorrow is tomorrow who knows what that is i'm breathing in and out nobody's bothering me what was all that about yes. now they didn't have a word for nervous system in those days presumably anatomy they could cut a body open they see bones and flesh and sinews nerves are so thin and tiny they probably didn't even notice them as an anatomical reference so there's no word for nerves in Pali, nervous system but they knew that something was happening and this is called sankara they knew the, the they knew the psych the the experience of it they didn't know the particular structures that in the body that that you know that, that ran through but can you imagine like is there any part of your body that you couldn't you could put a pin in it wouldn't feel something i i probably i would imagine there's nowhere in your body a normal body that doesn't feel something that's how much there is there right it's like a a woven shirt a woven suit that covers your entire form more even more than that you have another aspect of the nervous system which just to do with feeling balanced comfortable it's called parasympathetic and that's the one you want to focus on because in there you you'll get a sense of this is beneath all that surface personality structures in the body which are do with making and doing and getting things going you come into something more, more primary and you can train in that training that to discharge the stress of the personality and the more you do that the less intensity there is running into the personality because you're not constantly shoving energy down those channels down those i've got to be a good girl i've got to be on time I've got to make sure everybody likes me. I've got to do this. I shouldn't do that. I should try to be nice to people. I shouldn't be this. No. You don't have all that stuff running into those channels. So they don't get any food. Most of your food goes into, I am being present, I am here. Personality stuff starts to just very soft and cool, just yeah, I'm here. I can hear what you're saying. I'll see what I can do about that. Yeah. Yeah, as long as it's got ethics to it that's fine with me you know no personal no personality issues about appearance no compulsiveness that can be realized that can be realized in your own body yeah. you don't get knocked around instead what builds up energy it's composed permeates the entire body with ease pleasure you are very satisfied with that you don't really need boundary and control and ownership when you've got that you don't need walls around you you don't need to own something when you got this right all that stuff then becomes irrelevant and you're and then so this problem of the jitta as a centering experience how you can get a center can get so tight and idiosyncratic and personal and bossy 
and frightened and lonely is solved because the center opens to expand and widen and soften through the entire sense domain depending on the state of consciousness that you're in. Consciousness has certain different stages or levels to it. These are called jhanic levels and so forth, where the sense realm disappears. So dependent on those who have a very wide boundary. Formless realms, very, very wide sphere. It's called a formless sphere, very, very wide. Um, fine material boundary, fine material jhana, wide boundary. Sphere of loving kindness, very wide boundary. Domain of compassion, very wide boundary. Domain of self, very narrow. <laughs> very narrow, very besieged, <laughs> very lonely. <laughs> so like just start to figure out which way you're going to go and working through that. And essentially you work through that. And this is much more than meditation. <laughs> you know, that's why in many Buddhist cultures, say you want to train in this, you sure? Yeah, 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 well, you, you sure? Because it's going to be frustrating, you know that? Oh, it doesn't, yeah, very frustrating. It's going to drive your personality crazy. <laughs> <laughs> because you have to do things you don't feel like doing at the time you don't want to do it. It don't make sense to you, but you just do it. And the things you really think are important have to be done. Well, we might do that next week. You have to wait a while because we can't get them done right now. But, but, but. And the things you want to be with, oh, well, that's going. And the things you don't want to be with, well, that's coming. So what happens is the desire lines of your personality are continually frustrated. <laughs> In a monastic life, you can't eat something unless somebody gives it to you. So you... Maybe you go by the kitchen and think, oh, that's nice, that's nice, oh, no, that's, that'd be nice, yeah, but, and they don't give it to you. But, but, but you can't ask for it. Uh, and stuff happens. So uh, and very often in our practice, a lot of it is just this sense of relinquishing the boundaries, relinquishing the control systems, relinquishing the ownership systems not relinquishing ethics by no means ethics kindness absolutely and yet ownership control personal boundaries in terms of who you share space with sorry that's going to get that's going to get adjusted that's going to get you have to give that up can you do it you can just hurts a bit but that's the price that's the price it doesn't cost any money it just costs your personality <laughs> yeah but then of course he's saying yeah but this is the way to the deep happiness the sublime peace the ease the deathless it's worth it it's worth it. Up to you. Mm. Train, train the jitta. Take a little bit, let go a little bit. Feel the strength, let go a little bit more. Get used to that, strengthen up in that, let go a little bit more. Slowly, slowly you train the elephant to come into its true strength and to leave the crazy world. Okay, so that's all for your reflection today, and I hope some of it is useful. Handamayang dhamma kataya sadhu karang dhamma se sadhu sadhu. 
sadhu anumodam. Let's take a minute or two if you have time. <clears throat> I'll keep you long, but you know, I think what is missing with these sessions is like you're on retreat, there's a lot of time when the talk ends, you're just in this silent space with a lot of other people, you just sort of sit there and the bits of what's been said trickle down <laughs> into serious areas. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, so very important, I think, not just to, okay, now switch off the screen onto the next thing, just pause and imagine you're in that meditation hall and whatever's been said has been said. What stays? Where does the sense of faith arise, which will have a certain strengthening effect? And what piece, particular piece, you think that I can apply myself to? May not be much, maybe one or two pieces, that's all you need. One or two pieces you can apply yourself to. And that's that's the that's your harvest. So take some time. Let it sit in, sink. So, uh, fair respects to the Triple Gym, and uh, if uh, conditions are favourable, then uh, can maybe meet again in this way um, next week. I think perhaps it might be opportunity for questions, questions and answers. So um, we'll see what uh, comes up. <laughs> I probably won't be able to answer all of them, but I'll be able to look at a few and see what seems to be most general general use. Thank you. Take good care and bye for now. <laughs>